today is actually a much more kind of clinically focused talk, uh, focused around definitely psychosis, which is sort of the main focus of both my clinical work and my research, but also um, thinking about trauma. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of why those two things are the, are the, the focus of today. Um, and I have no disclosures to disclose. Um, so the learning objectives for today are to learn about uh, the psychosis prodrome and the role of trauma in the emergence of psychosis, uh, understanding how trauma and psychosis symptoms can look similar and different, and to consider what to do if you are concerned that someone might be experiencing symptoms of psychosis. So kind of thinking about this together clinically. I want to give credit to Lenny Torregrosa, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab last year um, and who um, has kind of helped formulate um, and think this talk through with me. Um, and she's now uh, working as um, in a clinical high risk lab at UCSF. Um, and I just wanted to give her um, that acknowledgement. So just you've heard a little bit about kind of my uh, research interests, but clinically, um, I work primarily within our early psychosis program at Vanderbilt. And um, I myself am a psychotherapist. I do outpatient psychotherapy, um, primarily CBT for psychosis and kind of run our internship program as well for psychologists. Um, and in the early psychosis program, we're typically seeing uh, young people, 18 to 24 years old, um, who have already sort of um, ha declared themselves as having a first episode of psychosis. So what this would mean is that they would already be kind of showing clear signs and symptoms of having a primary psychotic disorder. And even though we kind of think, okay, well, this person has a primary psychotic disorder, there's still lots of different things that could happen after that, right? There's lots of different disorders themselves that they could manifest with, whether that's schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder with psychotic features. We may not be sure at that point, but we're pretty certain that they have um, some sort of psychotic disorder that will likely be with them uh, for many, many years. Um, I actually kind of in the context of this started doing some assessments for folks where it was a little bit less clear whether they had a first episode of psychosis or were already transitioned into having a psychotic disorder. And these individuals, I think, I wonder if maybe you've seen clinically, they tend to be maybe around the ages of 15 to 18, although I actually did an assessment with a woman who was 27 the other day with very similar presenting questions. Um, and so, but really the kind of thing, the kind of question is sort of like assessing um, what are we seeing here? Are we seeing symptoms of psychosis or a psychotic disorder or sort of the early stages of that, which is what I'll talk a lot about today? Or are we seeing signs and symptoms that are almost um, not masquerading themselves, but sort of look a lot like psychosis? Um, but that we don't want to label someone as having a psychotic disorder. And certainly we would want to be very clear, as clear as we can, about treatment recommendations, um, kind of depending on uh, what they, what we think the underlying etiology is. And so I started doing assessments with these younger, younger individuals. Um, and primarily I use what's called the SIPS, which is the Structured Interview for Prodromal Symptoms. Um, and this is a semi-structured clinical interview. So I'm not going to be presenting the SIP itself today, but that sort of informs my assessments of individuals when there's a presenting question of what are we seeing here? Is this psychosis spectrum or is this something different, like maybe symptoms of trauma? Usually what happens if I'm trying to tease apart psychosis symptoms and trauma is that there's some sort of history of trauma, right? Seems kind of obvious, but you would want to probably start there. And I'm using trauma here. Some people are in the literature more and more also talking about childhood maltreatment. But we can think about kind of childhood trauma as the primary, um, a primary risk factor that we're interested in um, that the person is has had a experience with before we meet them. And when considering childhood trauma, we may also want to think about genetic vulnerability. And in particular, this would be genetic vulnerability to a psychotic disorder. Um, and that could be 
first degree relative with a psychotic disorder, like um, mom or dad, or um, a second degree relative, like aunt or uncle. And so the genetic vulnerability, however, would be more concerning for an emerging psychotic disorder, that in the context of trauma plus genetic vulnerability, we may be more likely to, to be seeing psychosis or psychosis symptoms. However, it's also possible that in the context of having exposure to trauma, we're the person is presenting with a trauma-related disorder, or it's called a trauma or stressor-related disorder. And so instead, they may be presenting with symptoms of that, of PTSD or acute stress disorder. And it's also possible that they have both, right? Of course. So there could be some comorbidity, um, and they could be having both signs and symptoms. Um, and what's really important and what can be kind of the trickiest, but to me the most interesting to assess, is how these two symptom profiles might be interacting with one another. And so typically um, we can see that symptoms of trauma or the experience of trauma can actually inform or sort of shape the psychosis that we're seeing. Uh, so as an example of that, an individual who protects in an abusive relationship might start to hear the voice of their abuser. And so that would be a clear example of how a trauma-related symptoms might sort of manifest in a psychosis, kind of in a psychotic way. Um, and so we may be sort of seeing both because we know that psychotic symptoms really are sort of a readout for the individual's culture and background and um, experiences that, that they've been through throughout their life. So this is just sort of a picture of what we are interested in um, when thinking about these assessments. Just to give a little background on trauma and psychosis, um, we've known for many years that these two um, kind of experiences are related to each other. So there's a very high prevalence of trauma history in individuals with schizophrenia, and there's a high comorbidity between PTSD and psychosis. In addition, exposure to childhood trauma is linked to subthreshold psychotic experiences in the general population and prodromal individuals, which I'll talk more about. And so this is really just to also kind of think about the spectrum of this, where maybe the individual doesn't have a primary psychotic disorder, but again, there's this sort of spectrum of psychosis experiences or trauma symptoms that seem to commingle. Early exposure to trauma predicts transition to psychosis in at-risk populations. And exposure to childhood trauma, just generally kind of in summary, uh, increases the likelihood of psychosis. So again, this is just to make the point that trauma and psychosis are very re highly related. And so you may be in a position where you need to kind of differentiate between signs and symptoms of one or the other. So I want to start by spending some time talking about the psychosis prodrome um, and what that can look like. So this kind of graph just identifies um, how we might think about the course of a primary psychotic disorder, like let's say schizophrenia. So here on the y-axis, you have symptom severity, and on the x-axis, you have time. And so this is just signifying kind of change over time in symptom severity. And so here, um, this would be sort of likely what we would consider the first episode of psychosis, the beginning of that sort of initial acute phase of a psychotic disorder, where the symptom severity of psychosis is quite high, um, and high enough usually to require some sort of inpatient hospitalization, maybe a partial hospital program. Um, but usually here, we're seeing that people need some sort of higher level of care. Um, and then this, you know, they may, this is obviously just an example of what can happen, but maybe their symptoms get a little bit worse over time, but ultimately, hopefully they receive some treatment and they start to recover. Um, and this line can look different for everybody, um, but they enter some sort of phase of recovery or ideally remission of their psychotic symptoms. When I'm sort of assessing folks or I'm curious about what's going on with individuals, um, oftentimes this is sort of the time period that I'm interested in or that I'm seeing. Um, and this is what we call the prodrome. And so during this prodromal period, this is the time, again, this is usually adolescence, where the individual is sort of presenting with signs and symptoms of psychosis, where they have symptoms of psychosis that are sort of above zero, but they're not so acute. And 
as I'll talk about in a minute, they're a little bit um, vaguer <laughs> because they're not as acute. Uh, and so this is sort of a time period where maybe the individual is experiencing, you know, some difficulty concentrating, some withdrawal, unusual experiences, but it's not so obvious yet um, that they have a psychotic disorder or are developing a psychotic disorder. What's important about that is that this time period can only technically be retrospectively identified. So the prodrome is a time in which you can only say that this person was prodromal after you know that they developed a psychotic disorder. And so because of that, it's really, we just need to be careful about kind of what we call the prodrome. Um, but I think this is just an interesting and important point is that we can't really know whether something's a prodrome until we say, oh, wow, yes, you know, Mr. Jones, who has schizophrenia, when he was 16 years old, he started experiencing these odd things. Maybe that was the start of his prodromal period. But as clinicians, if we're seeing somebody in their prodrome. We don't know it's their prodrome yet, if that makes sense. So instead, we as you know, researchers and, and clinicians um, have developed um, this idea of a clinical high-risk syndrome or a clinical high-risk symptoms and period where the individual is presenting with these sort of prodromal symptoms. But again, we're not sure yet whether it's a true prodrome. So I'm going to walk you through some of the most common clinical high risk symptoms that we see in these individuals. And these are the kinds of things that I'll be, I would be assessing for um, in these folks and that you likely assess for in adolescents um, or young adults that you see. So one would be um, perplexity and delusional mood. Um, and this is a fairly characteristic of this time period. Um, and this is when the individual is starting to experience just sort of things seeming strange or off. Um, delusional mood is a concept that was developed by a psychiatrist, Carl Jaspers. Um, and I think it really nicely captures this sort of odd or unusual period of time um, that some young individuals go through. And the kind of things that we'll be asking about during kind of to capture what I mean by delusional mood or perplexity is things like, have you been feeling like things are odd that you can't explain? Have you been having difficulty knowing whether things are real or whether things are unreal? Have things seemed sort of alien or evil or not human? Um, or have you sort of been experiencing slower? Are you experiencing more deja vu? These are the kinds of kind of odd things that I'm referencing when thinking about clinical high risk syndrome, or sorry, when thinking about perplexity and delusional mood. And so that is something that we might assess for and the individual may endorse and sort of give us a little bit more information about. Another feature um, of clinical high risk syndrome could be paranoia or suspiciousness. And so this, of course, in adolescence, we need to differentiate between social anxiety or, um, you know, just sort of that horrible <laughs> feeling you get when you're an adolescent and everyone's paying attention to you. Usually when we ask the initial sort of paranoia or suspiciousness questions, which are something like, you know, when you walk in a room, does it seem like people are noticing you? Everyone says yes, right? And so you need to sort of then determine, is there some sort of um, ill will that is assumed about this experience? Do they mistrust people? Are they feeling suspicious in some way about the intentions of others? That may be something that we would be more concerning about for something like paranoia or suspiciousness. Another would be ideas of reference. And so this could manifest more as things like coincidences. So the individual um, experiencing more coincidences, um, kind of paying attention to those, sort of making some meaning out of those. Um, also sort of taking special meaning from songs or feeling like, um, you know, celebrities are kind of sending them some sort of special message in some way. Um, and so ideas of reference are just generally thought to be sort of a building block of a broader, of sort of other psychotic symptoms. So the person might be noticing these sort of odd referential things, 
I have an individual right now who's really focused on um, hand gestures that people are making. Um, and so when he's driving, he th sees people kind of doing things with their hands and this means something to him. So that could be something that this individual starts to notice that they didn't really notice or think about before. Um, another would be hallucinations. So again, in a clinical high risk phase, this may not be, you know, a fully formed voice that they hear all the time and is experienced external to themselves. That would be more of a, you know, a, a, sim, a kind of true hallucination. This would be something more subtle than that, more like a perceptual abnormality. So maybe um, hearing ringing in their ears, hearing um, people whispering and really not knowing kind of what to make of that, hearing their name being called. So these are maybe some either auditory perceptual abnormalities. It could also be visual ones like shadows out of the corner of their eye, people's faces all of a sudden looking kind of strange. So those might be the kinds of things that we see here. You may also detect in these young people a worsening of school or work performance. Um, and so this could be because of maybe some of the distress or distraction of these other symptoms I just talked about. Um, or it could be kind of some of the cognitive deficits that we see in um, psychotic disorders starting to set in a little bit more. Um, and so here we might expect that during this clinical high risk syndrome, that school performance um, would suffer. And then the last one I'll mention would be social isolation or low social engage or low emotional engagement. And this again needs to be differentiated from depression, which can be very difficult. But this is more thinking about sort of that flat affect, the person not sort of feeling or feeling connected to their emotions in a way that is different than usual for them. And even though there's sort of like a deadening or a numbness in their connection to their emotions, again, they might not attribute it to feeling down and depressed or sad. It might actually just be sort of this flatness that sets in. So that would be a low emotional engagement where it's just more difficult to connect with them emotionally than it used to be. And family might be the ones who are particularly good at kind of reporting on this. Similarly, social isolation can go along with that. If you're not feeling things emotionally, social stuff is not that great. Uh, and so there may just be a drive for them to just stay home and kind of stay in their room and not engage. What is really important and hopefully encouraging about these clinical high-risk symptoms is that they're not uh, deterministic of a psychotic disorder. So let's say somebody comes into your clinic and they're 17 and they're reporting some of these things. It's not like, oh no, you're definitely about to develop schizophrenia. There's only a 25 to 30% chance that they're actually going to develop a primary psychotic disorder when presenting with these symptoms. I'll note that these symptoms are um, still not great and oftentimes predict some sort of psychopathology in adulthood. And so even if they don't develop a primary psychotic disorder, they're going to be at higher risk for developing any other kind of disorder, mood disorders, anxiety, um, etc. But it's still just nice to know that you're not seeing, you know, you don't have to, they're not definitely going to have schizophrenia, even if they're experiencing these things. And that actually there's majority of them will not. The other thing about kind of just thinking about this period is the things that we do want to look out for, um, and these are things that I assess for in this assessment that you could assess for clinically, are just kind of going to give you a better sense of whether these clinical high-risk symptoms are something to be concerned about when considering potential for a psychotic disorder. So one aspect or dimension of this would be frequency. So how often is this occurring? So if a person says, you know, oh, a couple of months ago, I heard my voice and, or I heard my name being called, but I don't know, I didn't really make anything of it. And I haven't heard it since. Okay, not too concerning. But if it's, you know, I heard my name being called, and then I started to hear more whispers. And now I think my neighbors might actually be the ones who are whispering, then we're a little bit more concerned that it's getting more and more frequent. Uh, they may be sort of on a trajectory towards a psychotic disorder. Distress is a really important predictor of developing a psychotic disorder when you're experiencing these high risk or experiencing these sort of psychotic like symptoms. Um, so individuals who sort of, again, have these weird things, but are just kind of like, eh, it's whatever. I'm not too worried about it. 
I'm on a soccer team. I'm with my friends. I'm not, you know, I'm cool. Then again, we're just like, you can calm down a little bit. It's not, it's not as concerning, but if it's really distracting to them, they're, they're not sure where it's coming from. It's causing a lot of emotional distress. Then they may, we may be more concerned about that. And this is actually where therapy can be a really useful tool is to try and tamp down some of the distress that they might be experiencing with these unusual symptoms uh, to try and mitigate some of that risk. Again, is this worsening over time? That is a key thing to be looking out for. So just kind of, I like this visual because I think it gives a good sense of, again, kind of all of the things that I'm talking about, which is just how we think about a psychotic disorder developing. And what you'll notice is that social adversity, which would include childhood trauma or maltreatment, would be, um, is something that can impact individuals at a as a risk factor for psychosis throughout their life. Um, and so ultimately um, is a major risk factor for the development of psychosis. Um, and you'll see sort of as time goes on into early adulthood, you see this sort of tapering off of, you know, a lot of people have anxiety and depressive symptoms, but then are they also having emotional and social withdrawal? And then are we seeing these prodromal symptoms and then they might develop psychosis. So I think this just gives a, a good picture. And when we think about social adversity, just to, again, kind of highlight the prevalence of this, reports are of childhood trauma are very high in individuals with first episode psychosis. So it's likely, actually, or higher than normal um, likelihood that if you're seeing someone with first episode psychosis, that they do have some sort of trauma history. So therefore, <laughs> we also want to understand kind of what trauma-related disorders look like uh, so that we can start to tease these things apart. So when I am talking about trauma or stress-related disorders, the ones I'm focusing on are acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And these have similar signs, um, you know, diagnostic criteria, acute stress disorder just being between three days and one month of time, and then post-traumatic stress disorder lasting for more than a month um, after a trauma. And so in both in trauma and stress-related disorders, criterion A is exposure to a trauma. So of course they need to have had a trauma in order to get one of these disorders or qualify for them. And then there are certain categories of traumatic symptoms um, that we need to be assessing for. So one, the first is intrusions. Um, so these could be intrusive thoughts, distressing dreams, and also flashbacks. Um, in the DSM, flashbacks is also kind of referred to as dissociative experiences, and I'll talk about dissociation more in a minute. Um, avoidance is another common trauma symptom. Uh, so this could be avoidance of reminders of the traumatic event, but you also want to be really thoughtful about what that means to the person, because um, it can be more nuanced than just, um, I don't want to see my uncle because he molested me, right? It's not just, I'm going to avoid my uncle. It could also be, I want to avoid... Um, you know, going to the ice cream place that we used to go to when we tended to see my uncle, right? Or, um, you know, some of the clothes that remind me of that time or uh, not wanting to go to any sort of family functions because it reminds you of that side of the family. So avoidance can be a much broader thing. And of course, the, the broader it becomes, the more limiting it can be for that individual. Um, we also see alterations in cognition and mood. So this can be, um, you know, negative thoughts, intense emotions, um, and sort of these negative beliefs about the world. The world is not a safe place. Um, I can't trust people. And then finally, kind of changes in arousal and reactivity. So this might be hypervigilance, difficulty sleeping, um, irritability, etc. So I just want to note dissociation, which I'll talk more about in a minute, but dissociations are really tricky when it comes to differentiating with psychosis. Um, and so that's why I want to highlight this, because oftentimes people will come in reporting sort of these odd, unusual experiences and you're, it's pretty unclear whether these are dissociative experiences or psychotic experiences. If you think about how I described delusional mood earlier, sort of feeling like things are unreal, not really feeling connected to things, that is 
very much how people describe dissociation. So that's a good example um, of sort of just to to plug that of how these things can look kind of similar to one another. Um, and dissociations can occur in the context of PTSD. They are an intrusion, intrusion symptom, um, but you can give people PTSD with or without dissociative symptoms. They're not necessary. And this is all just to say that all of these, of course, exist on a spectrum. And so there's going to be sort of more severe trauma-related um, symptoms such as in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but we can also see trauma symptoms that are not meeting criteria for PTSD, but that are still impacting the person. Um, and so again, I, I just assessed somebody who had um, was in sort of a quote unquote toxic relationship with an ex-boyfriend um, that clearly was still impacting her. And it didn't meet criteria for PTSD, but it was definitely contributing to a lot of the paranoia and sort of odd experiences that she was having. And so you just want to be thoughtful that even if they don't have PTSD, trauma might still be playing a role in how they're So I want to kind of walk through some ways that trauma and psychosis symptoms can look really similar clinically um, and therefore how it can be, why it's important to sort of differentiate these. So one would be a person reporting flashbacks. Um, and so an individual reporting flashbacks may report sort of seeing sort of things from their past, um, experiencing them maybe physically, so almost feeling like physically touched um, or um, smelling things that were from um, this period of time when they had this trauma. And so they're kind of describing these very sensory experiences that other people can't see or experience. So that's basically the definition of a hallucination, right? Sort of a sensory experience that other people in your environment are not having. And so this would be an example of when if somebody is just reporting this sort of sensory experience, it's not really clear, is this a hallucination in the context of psychosis, like feeling people touching you or having a olfactory hallucination, or is this a flashback that the person's having or reporting? Another would be avoidance. So avoidance associated with trauma can look a lot like so social withdrawal in the context of psychosis or a psychotic disorder. Um, so again, if they're avoiding things related to the trauma, then they may also be withdrawing socially. Um, or in the context of psychosis, it may be a social withdrawal because of negative symptoms or something else. So um, you want to differentiate between those two things. Also hypervigilance. So if you kind of assessed somebody who's very hypervigilant, they might be sort of looking around a lot. They might kind of look distracted. They might seem very nervous. And that could be a hypervigilance because of trauma, or you might interpret it like if I'm, you know, in our crisis assessment unit and somebody's kind of doing that, I might think, oh, they're responding to internal stimuli right? They're hearing voices. Um, and, or I might think, oh, they're very paranoid. Maybe they're not looking at me. They're sort of just look really kind of anxious and overwhelmed. I might interpret that as a paranoia, that they don't trust me as their provider. They're, they're feeling very mistrustful or suspicious of me. And so again, that's just kind of how those two things can look very similar. And finally, alterations in cognition. People with, you know, PTSD might report like, I don't trust anyone, right? The world is not a safe place. And so that could just be from PTSD, but it can also be something that's more delusional or more paranoid. And so you do want to start poking around and assessing for kind of what that sounds like. So if the person says, you know, oh, well, I just can't trust anyone because I had this terrible thing happen to me. And ever since then, I've never been able to develop a relationship. Okay, that sounds like PTSD to me. But if they're saying, you know, I can't trust anyone. And so when I see people on the street and they look at me a certain way, it makes me wonder if they can read my thoughts or that they um, might be following me. Now I'm thinking a little bit more about paranoia. So you just kind of, again, want to poke into these things a little bit more. So I want to spend a minute thinking together about dissociative experiences. Um, 
which are defined very broadly as disruptions to the usual way that we piece together and connect different parts of our world. Um, and dissociative experiences, like everything that we're, I'm talking about today, exist on a spectrum. Um, and so on the one end of the spectrum, there might be daydreaming, um, which most of us have probably experienced. Um, and so just sort of getting a little bit lost in thought, not feeling as connected or grounded to kind of what's going on in the here and now, um, all the way to sort of a complete dissociation from one's environment or identity. Uh, and so if that were to occur, then we would be more in sort of a dissociative kind of thinking a little bit more about like dissociative disorders. Um, and so that would be sort of at the extreme end of the spectrum. And so with um, this, however, just to, just is just to say that we can sort of understand or relate to some of these experiences. And the types of dissociations that we're talking about, particularly in the context of trauma, would be derealization and depersonalization. So derealization is a sense of feeling disconnected from the world around you. So feeling, again, kind of like I described with delusional mood, like the world um, seeming strange or fake or like you're just kind of like literally like walking around in a dream. Um, in terms of just again, highlighting how this can kind of contribute to psychosis or relate to psychosis, there could be an interpretation where the person is experiencing dissociation. So they're saying the world seems strange or unreal. And then they might kind of go that extra mile and think, I wonder if the world isn't real. I wonder if actually people are androids, or I wonder if I'm dead. And those kinds of things would, of course, be a little bit more concerning for a psychosis process. Similarly, there's depersonalization, which is not feeling connected to oneself. So feeling like you're kind of floating outside of yourself, you're looking down at your body, that your body and your mind are not um, tightly linked. Broadly speaking, in the literature, there's kind of ideas that dissociation itself is a coping mechanism um, in the face of trauma, that the kind of reason, quote unquote, that people might start to dissociate would be to sort of disconnect or cope with a very difficult or traumatic experience um, and not sort of stay connected to that. Um, this is sort of an area of research, but I just wanted to mention that this is sort of how some people think about dissociation. So I did wanna present a little bit of data from our lab um, because we are, um, I think as a field in the psychosis field, um, starting to recognize or think about dissociation a little bit more uh, than we used to, which was, Almost never, <laughs> I would say. Um, and so dissociative experiences, I would say, are just increasingly being recognized in individuals with psychotic disorders because we're starting to assess for them a little bit more. So what I'm presenting here is data um, that we've collected from individuals with schizophrenia in gray. And what we did is we identified them while they were in our inpatient hospital. And then we um, kind of recruited them into the study as soon as we could after they left the hospital or maybe even sometimes while they were still in the hospital and then followed them over the course of six months. And this scale here is called the felt sense of anomaly scale, which is a dissociation scale. It's a self-report scale um, that is really easy to administer and well-validated. It came out about a year ago, and I, I think it's really, really cool. Um, so I highly recommend it. It's publicly available. Um, and so we gave the scale to individuals with schizophrenia and some non-clinical uh, comparison participants. And so what I just want to note to everybody is, of course, that there's a big group difference, right? So individuals with schizophrenia are reporting more dissociative experiences than people without schizophrenia. Um, and this is a really big difference. I mean, this isn't like I'm a little, I'm dissociating a little bit more. These are quite notable changes in sort of their perceptions of their body and their connection with the world. Um, and the, so the other thing that I think is very interesting is that over time, this is, um, relatively stable. So there's actually not a significant change over time in dissociative experiences, which is not what we see in this data set in things like, you know, delusion severity or hallucinations, which are significantly 
declining over the course of recovery. And so this suggests to me that dissociative experiences might actually be sort of like this stable kind of risk or state of unusual experiences that people with psychotic disorders have that, again, we're just not doing a very good job of assessing for. Similarly, in a very large kind of cohort of individuals with psychotic disorders, um, almost a thousand of them, uh, two thirds reported experiencing having dissociative experiences in the last two weeks. So again, this is just to highlight this kind of intermingling of these trauma symptoms and psychotic symptoms and how they tend to relate and co-occur with one another. Because of this, it's kind of our job to try and help differentiate between this trauma response and psychosis or psychosis risk. So this table just gives us a little bit of a snapshot of the types of symptoms that we might expect in these different disorders. So we have chronic PTSD, dissociative identity disorder, and schizophrenia. And this is certainly not, you know, perfect, but it's just, again, to kind of give a feel for what kind of algorithms we might develop in our mind about what to expect in certain situations. So for instance, blunted affect. So if you're meeting with an individual, maybe they're reporting, you know, odd, unusual experiences, they're a little bit paranoid, or they sound kind of paranoid, um, but they have a pretty significant trauma history. If they're very kind of affable, well, not affable, but kind of like they have good affect, right? They're sort of connecting with you. They, they're they able to talk about it in sort of a, um, you know, an appropriate affective way. Then we may be thinking a, a little bit more about PTSD and, D, and or DID, depending on the presentation, versus schizophrenia. I would also, however, kind of put it the opposite way, which is if the, the individual is presenting very blunted, very flat, and you're not able to really connect with them in the way you would expect emotionally, then you might want to think a little bit more about schizophrenia. Certainly it's not the, then you don't immediately diagnose them with schizophrenia, obviously, but you might sort of, this might be a clue for you that this could be more of a psychotic disorder presentation if they're presenting with very blunted affect that's fairly stable over time. One that's harder is um, voices. So voices are one of the most common psychotic, I think probably the most common psychotic symptom in trauma-related disorders, um, which I think is very interesting. Um, and so if a person is presenting and reporting hallucinations, it's actually not that helpful. That's usually when you get really confused <laughs> because usually when we think, oh, they're hearing voices, we think, oh, they have schizophrenia or some sort of psychotic disorder. But actually voices and hallucinations are not that uncommon in the context of trauma. And so you do wanna be sort of very careful and understanding and assessing what are these hallucinatory experiences like for this person. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Another one that I'll highlight is insight into illness. So there are plenty of people with schizophrenia who have insight into their illness and can talk about their symptoms and their experiences with good insight. But it's going to be more likely that we see that flexibly in individuals with PTSD or DID without a psychotic disorder. So what I mean by that is perhaps they might be able to reflect on, um, you know, yeah, ever since I was a little kid and these, you know, I was molested. I've just felt like the world is kind of a strange and untrustworthy place. And it makes me feel really upset. And when I go places, I hear voices and it, and it sounds like my abuser and it's very strange and I hate it. You know, they might be able to just sort of talk about it more in that way, as opposed to maybe someone with schizophrenia who might just sort of more, more directly say, you know, well, my, uh, you know, my, uncle, my abuser talks to me. Right. Like a little bit more sort of um, ingrained in their ex daily experience and their sense of self than we might see in PTSD, where they're able to sort of reflect on it with higher metacognition. So that could be another way that you start to sort of tease apart clinically. What do you what do I think I'm seeing here? When you are kind of assessing someone, you may want to think, OK, I'm going to consider a trauma related disorder. Obviously, when there's a history of trauma, 
Um, but also if there's amnestic episodes that are present. So that's another thing I haven't really mentioned, but in schizophrenia, we don't really see amnestic episodes in the way that you do, you might in a trauma related disorder, where the individual is like, I just lost time, right? Like I either like lost time, or, you know, I know I was abused as a kid. I just don't remember much about it. Or like, I feel like I have a void in my memory for those times. That would be a little bit more concerning for for trauma. If formal thought disorder and negative symptoms are absent, again, you might be thinking more about a trauma-related disorder. Formal thought disorder would be disorganization, disorganized speech, behavior. Um, And so if the individual is very linear, very goal-directed, easy to talk to, easy to connect with, um, reflective on their experiences, then, you know, this might be a trauma picture, even again, if they're reporting a lot of paranoia or hearing voices um, or seeing things more consistently. And similarly with negative symptoms. Just in terms of sort of thinking about those positive symptoms. So I've been alluding to kind of like, oh yes, people with trauma will report hallucinations um, and maybe some paranoia. And the thing that can be different about this is that in trauma, those hallucinations tend to be more vivid, so more complex, uh, and also are resistant um, or tend to be resistant to pharmacotherapy. So these actually are two really helpful things, especially the vividness when you're assessing somebody. So for instance, if I'm talking to an adolescent and they say, you know, oh no, I see like a fully formed person in front of me and they are talking to me and interacting with me, um, but nobody else in my environment sees them. That is not super indicative of schizophrenia or a psychotic disorder. I I would not expect that. In psychosis, you'd expect more sort of like, I, you know, maybe I see people around, but they kind of then like disappear or like it's a big crowd um, and I see maybe people look turn and look at me but then other people don't see that or I see kind of like animals in trees when it's kind of dark outside like it's more subtle usually um but in a trauma related disorder they tend to be more vivid and I'll give you a case example just briefly of somebody who really helped me understand this which was a um a 16 year old girl who I treated for in therapy um and worked very closely with her psychiatrist here at Vanderbilt to kind of um, give her treatment. And she was reporting initially, um, you know, some auditory hallucinations, but also this visual hallucination of um, what I imagined in my head to be sort of like a slender man figure. Um, although I don't have any confirmation on that. That was just sort of my image of him, but just sort of this creepy male figure that she would see regularly, daily. And who would sort of like show up when she was stressed and kind of come at her when she was really overwhelmed and like kind of try to touch her. And this and then but was also reporting hearing voices. And so the psychiatrist and I started by tackling the voices and and the hallucinations through a psychosis treatment. So I was doing CBT for psychosis with her. Um, and she was being given antipsychotics and it wasn't really helping that much. Um, and so as I'll talk about in a minute, we tried something else. We switched to a more trauma focused lens and it made a huge difference on her symptoms. And so this is sort of hopefully a good example of like how things like getting this right. (laughs) And of course we got it wrong at first. We kind of took a gamble and picked one and didn't get it correct. Um, And that was okay. But ultimately that um, this is why, how you might want to look out for these things. Related to the trauma. Also, she was abused by a man. It would seem like it was fairly connected to the trauma um, that you may be thinking more about a trauma related disorder. 
So in terms of some other considerations, so you may want to think about, again, the timing of these symptoms. So are they related to, of course, the timing of the trauma, um, but then also are there certain triggers for when they come up? So again, for her, it was sort of like things that reminded her of the trauma would trigger seeing this, you know, visual hallucination. Um, and so then it might be, oh, okay, I think these psychotic experiences are sort of linked up with the trauma response. Again, you also want to thinking about course. So in the psychosis prodrome, things are going to be more progressive. Um, and so those who convert to a psychotic disorder, it's going to be, um, we're going to start to see changes over time. In trauma, it may not get significantly worse over time. It may be that they're sort of more intermittent or that there are more rapid fluctuations um, for the individual. And it's less the sort of like progressive course of worsening. So I want to end with some just general recommendations. Um, these are the kinds of things that we talk, I talk with families and providers about um, after kind of giving an assessment like this. So the first thing that I always recommend is monitoring the young person. Um, so not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they hate as a recommendation, like make sure you pay a lot of attention to them, but really you're monitoring for certain things. Um, so you're monitoring for do these experiences that they're reporting, whether it's hallucinations or feeling kind of like the center of attention or feeling these coincidences, are these getting more frequent? Are they more intrusive, distressing, impairing, all of that stuff? And that's the kind of things that I'm assessing for. You might also want to think about just like severity. And when I'm talking about severity, typically I'm talking about conviction or sort of flexibility and, and your ability to induce doubt. So for instance, if a young person kind of comes in and they say, yeah, I think my parents might have put cameras around my room to make sure, you know, to kind of monitor me. But I don't know. I looked for the cameras. I didn't find anything. Maybe I'm wrong. And then, you know, a couple months later, they come in and they say, well, my parents put cameras in my room, which is really messed up that they did that. Can't believe they did that. And I know that they did it um, because I can hear sort of like the feedback from the cameras when I'm trying to fall asleep. And I keep confronting them about it and they keep denying it. And we're getting in all these fights about it. That to me is a progression, right? So from the sort of more flexible mindset around it to a more convicted one, that feels more severe to me. And like this person might be transitioning into psychosis. I just wanna mention that um, one thing that you can do with patients, especially if you're sort of feeling a little overwhelmed by some of these symptoms, which I often am um, when, cause they can come in very distressed is that sensory grounding is going to help with both, which is great. Um, and so even if you're not sure, you could teach them some sensory grounding techniques, have them use it as a tool, because whether it is hallucinations from a psychotic disorder or dissociations from trauma, it's going to help both of these types of symptoms. Um, so one that I really like and that we sort of adopted here uh, in our clinic is 54321 grounding. Um, so this is acknowledging five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Um, and so this is just an easy technique, although I often have to Google what the senses are in each because uh, I forget, but it's very simple. It's easy to look up uh, if you forget. And um, patients seem to really like it. And you can kind of, I usually teach it with them um, fairly interactively um, to begin. So I might say, you know, okay, let's try this technique. And instead of it being like, okay, I see, you know, a water bottle and a keyboard and a, you know, coffee mug and like all of this stuff just very rapidly, um, you want to kind of help them savor the experience. So um, looking around, oh, I see a lamp and it's got these pretty colors and I got it at a flea market and it's, um, you know, a fake Tiffany's lamp, but I don't know, you could kind of talk about it and I have this lamp here, obviously, um, and it kind of get them to just sort of in similarly with all the other senses. And it also just makes it more fun and whether they're hearing voices or again, kind of going into more of a dissociative experience, it's going to get them more connected with the external 
world um, and reconnect them. And also it can just be a very nice kind of social thing to do with them. Um, and that can also often help both. Um, another is of course, just like fidgety things. Um, this is just a random picture of them, but like just thinking about, you know, again, if this person is in school, for instance, and they're saying, oh, when I'm in school, I get really distracted by the hallucinations or the dissociative experiences or this sense that things are unreal, um, then you may have them buy some sort of fidget that they can just touch or smell um, that can kind of help reground them. And again, even if you're not sure what the etiology is, it should help with both. The last thing I'll mention is if trauma is known, but psychosis is a concern, you could try treating the trauma symptoms. And the reason I say that is because like I, in my kind of example where we didn't do that, <laughs> where we treated the psychosis symptoms first and not the trauma, that um, trauma trauma symptoms A might be a little bit more targetable, especially, you know, with both therapy and medicine. And so if you can help that and you kind of know, okay, I'm not exactly sure, but they definitely have trauma and I'm pretty sure these are symptoms of trauma, then treat the trauma because we're pretty good at treating trauma and then um, see what happens with the psychosis symptoms, right? And if they had a comorbid psychotic disorder, then they'll maybe stay relatively stable and that's fine. But at least you kind of got rid of the, you know, you have impacted the trauma. So that's one way of thinking about it. The other is that, like how I mentioned before, trauma is often fueling the psychosis fire. So these sort of distressing experiences, the sort of negative cognitions, the intrusions, the flashbacks, all of that, the psychosis sort of feeds off of. So if you can tamp down those symptoms, then actually the psychosis can kind of quiet as well, even if they have a psychotic disorder. So that I think is just something that I would recommend thinking about is if you're not sure, treat the trauma and then kind of monitor what happens with the psychosis. So I'm a psychologist, so I can really only speak to therapy. Um, but just as a couple of examples, this would be maybe a trauma focused CBT, uh, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure. Um, is highly effective. And then you could also, if you have um, this available to you, do DBT with them if kind of, sort of for more of the um, emotion regulation difficulties that come along with PTSD or trauma. And so you could, again, just sort of give them a nice toolbox for this, address the trauma, see what happens with the psychosis. Um, I will just mention medication. Again, I am not a medication provider. And I'd also imagine that, you know, giving antipsychotics to a 14 or 15 year old may feel a little, you know, you may feel a little uncertain about that, or families might have some concerns about that. And so if that's the case, again, this might be a good time to sort of treat the other symptoms of the trauma and see what happens with the psychosis. Because again, in my like, my case example, when we, we actually ended up treating her with prolonged exposure, I did PE with her. And she ended up going off the antipsychotic because her sim her hallucinations went away after prolonged exposure. And so she didn't need an antipsychotic anymore And because it, it hadn't actually been really doing anything for her, um, it turned out. And then the we were able to, though, kind of work through it therapeutically. And then she did end up on antidepressants and anxiety. She's still at very high risk for developing a psychotic disorder, no doubt. But kind of during this period of time, during this kind of year, year and a half that we saw her, that was sort of the treatment that ended up being the most effective for her. So that is the end of my talk. I wanted to just sort of remind everyone that I am part of this early psychosis program at Vanderbilt. So um, if you have any questions or you have people you're not sure about or want assessments for, or also just to talk through and consult, um, I'm always happy to talk about this um, and at least put our heads together, even if we don't have any clear answers. So feel free to email me um, or you can always call for referrals if that is something that would be useful um, for you or any of you. And thank you guys all for listening. <laughs>